Chela and Rabawa Anushi. I am Dr. Bedede Shasta Modoc Klamath and a citizen of the Confederate Tribes of Siletz. My pronouns are she, her, and I am zooming in from Muskogee Territory in the heart of Indian Country, Oklahoma. Hello, my name is Amber Ball and I'm the Executive Director of In the Margin. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome you to our featured Indigenous Peoples Day panel as part of the New American Theater Festival presented by In the Margin, B Street Theater, and the National New Play Network. So this is our first panel in a series of three sponsored by the incredible HowlRound. We have two more panels this month, Power and Theater Coalition Building, Wednesday, October 20th, that features In the Margin's partner companies who helped make it possible. Then, Adaptation and New Creation, Thursday, October 21st, featuring some of the amazing featured playwrights. So, today, we are joined by some incredible Native women leading in the arts industry. <laughs> we will be discussing their practices, methodologies, and of course, just amplifying and celebrating the work they continue to contribute to the arts world. So to start, Muriel, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, where you're zooming in from, pronouns, titles, organizations, affiliations. Okay, my name is Muriel borst Herent. I'm from the Kuna Rappahannock uh, Nations. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I am the artistic director of Safe Harbors New York City, um, which is the the which is the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, Munsee Lenape, Shinnecock, and Matinecock, and Canarsis. Um, Right now, I'm um, sitting in, which is the traditional territories of Lenny Lenape land, which is New Jersey. Anything else? <laughs> that's amazing, thank you. <laughs> Lafani, let's have you go next. Awesome, I'm, on Sacramento. I'm in Sacramento, California right now, which I believe I texted that, whose land are you on number? And it said Nishinan. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Um, but I'll do my introduction. Wakri sat ne lofani tani sasat ne amodakni choi black choi tongan choi talakwa choi ochkini choi tongan. Ma loilele ko kuingwa ko lofani tani aise ko guhau me Oregon mo America mo Tonga mo many other places. Um, hello everyone, greetings. My name is Lofani Tani. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, I'm Black Indigenous, I'm Black and I'm Tongan, and my tribes are Talakwa, Modoc, and Klamath. Um, again, I'm on Nishinan lands, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Please correct me if any of you know how to correctly pronounce it. Um, I'm currently an In the Margin Theater um, ensemble member, yes. Um, and I'm in Sacramento because I was in um, the opening play reading exhaustion. <laughs> My son, and it was so much fun. It was such a cool experience, and so I'm down here for longer. And I, I really like Sacramento, California, in general. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm also a mentee at the American Influencer Council. Um, I do a lot of digital creation. I'm a digital creator, uh, create creator, um, an influencer, and I like making art. And I'm just figuring out kind of like what art looks for me, like how I can bring my power and stand in my power through art and um, doing that. And I also just graduated from the University of Oregon and I double majored. I did Asian studies, focused on Korean. I did indigenous race and ethnic studies. And I also did the, the minor, I think they have a whole PhD program now, but I did the minor in Native American studies. So we out here just graduated half the press, um, but excited to learn and really excited to be on this dope panel with all of y'all. So I'm ready to learn and have some conversation. So thank you so much. Nice to meet everybody virtually. Amazing. Jeanette, would you like to go next? Hello, I'm Jeanette Harrison. My family's on Indaga and I am, uh, I spend most of my time these days on the lands of the coast of Miwok, but thanks to the pandemic, I am hanging out on the lands of the Tongva. Um, I am the artistic director of Alter Theater Ensemble. Um, and uh, I feel like I left out everything. I feel like this is a pop quiz and I just failed. <laughs> and my pronouns are she, her, hers. <laughs> yeah, I was like coming in. It's like, go ahead. <laughs> Amazing, yes. Thank you so much, Jeanette. <laughs> so 
to start the conversation, I would love to invite the audience to go to get to know each of you with the panelists better. And I think a great way to start would just to be how did you enter the field of arts theater? What was your journey to where you are now for those of all generations who want to pursue the arts, as well as like any family history or even legacies that also helped influence your direction? Um, Muriel, it would be great to start with you again. Okay. Um, well, um, I grew up in theater, not only from my family's theater company, um, Spider Woman Theater. My mother was a touring actress and I went on tour with her with Open Theater and to Europe when I was very young. Um, I was also a child performer and I was in the field and I started around, started professionally dancing around five, seven, you know, um, then I started working as an actress around eight to 10 and I continued to uh, perform until I was like 18, I took a break. And then I decided to go back to school. And so what I did was I got my degree in theater from LIU and it was there. I really was able to develop what I was going to do now for my, for my future, you know, um, right now, what I'm working on, do you want me to know what I'm working on or just how did I get into it? Or <clears throat> is that what you're, yeah, I, I, I come from New York city, which is, sometimes very difficult because we have so many things going on in New York. We have so many different ethnicities happening. And so, you know, what happens is that we are always constantly fighting against the percentages and how do we get people, you know, how are we included in the, um, how are we included in the conversation, even the EDI conversation? Even we see you, you know, we really need to be in the conversation. And a lot of times everybody's spoken about but us. And this is our land that we're on, right? I think things of inclusion are getting better, but let's hope it gets better than that. I served um, as a special assistant to the Northern Representative uh, uh, to the United Nations for um, over six years. And one of those things I really, really learned there was not only politics, but what is our right? What is our human right as Native peoples, right? What is our cultural right? What does that mean? If you're going to exclude us, it's a right for us to be at the table. And that's mostly a lot of my work. Um, other than writing plays, I do a lot of talking to theaters so we're not excluded from the conversation. And that's really what I'm trying to do all the time. And it's not only me, there's other actors, there's other um, theater companies out there, but you know, we can't just have one, you know what I mean? And, and then someone said to me, well, you know, you stop when you do that, you know, you're not going to get hired. I'm like, I don't care. I, I, I'm working too much. <laughs> and I don't like to say that, but I mean, the reality is there's not one, this is a movement. This is a theater movement. And this is how I see it. And it takes more than one person to do a theater movement. Right. It, you know, and so that's how I really, really see it. Yes. Well, I think that also ties into the founding of Safe Harbors NYC. Um, of how that just started as a safe place. I was also hoping you would discuss that too, just the founding of the company. Mm -hmm. um, safe Harbor started as a um, program at La Mama called Safe Harbor's Indigenous Collective. We found out that Indigenous was too wide a wor word because there was a lot of international work there. And even though I did work at internationally, we needed, we had to break off and like, they had to do international. I still consult for, with them. I'm also their, um, their resident artist there. And then from there, we, we started to form um, Safe Harbors New York City, which is primarily, primarily about um, Nor North American native peoples and how we look at theater, right? And it was founded originally by myself and my husband, um, Kevin Tarrant. And we both, he was the managing director, and he was the executive director, managing director, bookkeeper. He took care of everything. He recently passed away. So what I had to do is I had to take over as the, I mean, I was the artistic director, but I had a collaborative force. 
And so we brought many different people on so we could figure out what is it that we're going to do, how we're going to go about it, what is the vision? What is the vision not from a program, not just from me and my husband, but what is that vision in theater? And where, where do we see ourselves 10, 20 years? You know, and I brought people in like yourself, Amber, who really had that, who shared that vision with me. And I am happy to be here with you. <laughs> um, Jeanette, kind of the same question to you, um, starting back at how did you enter the fields, arts of theater, your journey, um, family histories and legacies, legacies that also helped influence your direction? Um, well, I would say that theater was was more of a um, an accident for me. Um, I went to college completely convinced that I was going to be a journalist, um, but I got a work study job working at a award winning magazine. And so I decided that first year I was not going to join the school paper. I was just going to explore everything else that I could. And a buddy of mine in the dorm said, hey, I'm stage managing this show. You should come and be my ASM. And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but sure, okay. Um, and, uh, and, and so I forgot to leave. And that's how, that's how I got into theater. Amazing. I love that this happy, beautiful accident and this legacy behind it. <laughs> I was also curious um, if you could talk to us too about the founding of Alter Theater, how that came to be, the process, and then kind of like where it is now, et cetera. Um, yeah, okay. Um, how did Alter Theater get started? Well, um, a bunch of us were kind of early in our careers and um, we were um, hitting roadblocks. Um, you know, Alter Theater got started not long after 9-11. And um, we, there were five of us who founded the company, one of whom had a television career that was starting to, to, to go, um, except she was, um, she was brown. She didn't pass. Like, I mean, I, I, I went to a casting session for native actors and they told me, you know, you should dye your hair blonde. Like erasing being native was the, the way forward for me in my career. And I was like, you know what? I can walk into any room I want, take the earrings out and you know, I can pass. That's not, that's, that's not my thing here. That's not what I'm looking for. That's not how I honor my family and how I wanna do my work. Um, but she couldn't. She suddenly went from going in for the lead roles and being the random wild card when everybody else in the room was blonde um, to being called in for terrorist wife terrorist sister. Um, and we were also seeing that theater in the, the Bay Area, which is where we mostly were, um, was suddenly making very safe choices. And then on top of all of that, you know, the bridge toll more than doubled. Um, and suddenly we were like, let's just make, make work on our own side of the bridge here. This is ridiculous. So we purposely founded a company that was committed to artists, that was committed to taking artistic risk that was about defying stereotypes. Um, we, we were, um, we've always been at the forefront of um, using, using color and casting in ways that challenge stereotypes rather than reinforce them. And every single show, I, I had a, I've had a career as a casting director as well. And um, my whole philosophy is every single role, this is where we start. Every single role is open to everybody. If you as the director or you as the playwright believe otherwise, you need to make the case to me. And that's where we start. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's no surprise that Alter Theater has never produced August Wilson. You know, we, we look for those plays that, that, or we did, we looked for those plays that had that ability to bring all of us together. Um, and then, you know, that was in 2004 and as, um, uh, things have changed and um, we have been more vocal about the fact that no, it's not just enough to tell other people's stories. We want more opportunities to tell our own stories. Um, and for me, that's been more of a journey, you know, and not growing up with, um, with a lot of um, having, because, because my college was a very white theater program. It didn't matter that the kids in it weren't necessarily all white, but it was a student run program run by white theater makers and white professors with a very classical 
um, uh, worldview and lens on all of the work. They, there was a Native American studies program, but there was one professor and he was white and he was just bemoaning the fact that in order to get anywhere in Native American studies these days, you had to be native. It's like, um, okay, I think I'm dropping your class. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so now it's, it's um, it, 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 in constantly trying to push the envelope, um, we challenge our, our fellow theater companies to do better. And then when they start doing better, we take it another step further because it's just not been enough. Um, and I would say that um, the incremental change has been really exhausting. And I've now been in this field for 20 years. Alter Theater is 17 years old. And yet here we are, and I'm looking, and I can't wait to, to hear um, from, from Amber and Lafani Tani because you guys are like my hope um, for the, 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 the natives, native artists who are coming up. And I really hope you're having different experiences. And my fear is that all the work that we have done, it's not been enough. And so I am now at a point where I'm like, burn it down. I'm done, burn it down. Um, yeah, so, so, okay, that's, that's a few tangents away from the original question, but uh, that's kind of where Alter Theater got started out of a dissatisfaction with the status quo. And I think that is where we are. Um, and where we are today is that we are very interested in telling stories by, for, and with authentic voices and with community. Oof, beautiful. Thank you for sharing, Jeanette. Let's see. And the following, Tani, the same question to you. Again, how did you enter the field arts of theater? What was your journey to where you are now? For those up there, again, all generations who want to pursue the arts, as well as like any family history or even legacies that also helped influence your direction. Yeah. First of all, I just like to say, burn it down. I like, <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, but let's see. So, I was born in Portland, Oregon, and I was raised by my mom and my, my grandmother and my kind of like my family mostly. Um, so I was born and raised Portland, Oregon in the city and then also rurally on like my reservation homelands in Southern Oregon. So back and forth between Portland and Southern Oregon. Um, and so I feel like I came into the art world mostly through my mother. My mother is an artist. Um, she took me to school with her. I would go to some of her classes. She majored in like some of the same majors like uh, Native Studies and um, Ethnic Studies at the time, but now it's Indigenous Race and Ethnic Studies. So I remember going to classes with her, just watching her do her thing and get into her own, uh, step into her own power and her own art. And so I got to see that at an academic level and then going back and forth from the city to the reservation, I got to see just like her art with that. And she even took me abroad to New Zealand to get her master's degree. And so I got to see indigenous art and like, um, yeah, because I think we went to New Zealand because there wasn't that kind of indigenous presence on university campuses. And so we had to go to a whole indigenous area, um, not in the US. So I'm trying to think if I'm explaining this. Yeah, so anyway, born and raised, rural city. And I just remember being in the studio with my mom, doing, watching her do her art. She'd give me a canvas sometimes. Um, I think in the city for me, like I'd see like children's programs, like, oh, theater brigade, like join our theater. But there was a lot of students of no color. Like, and so it was just really like, I was like, you want me to be a tree? I don't want to just be like a random tree or like say no, that does not sound true to me. But I remember like writing these stories and like it was always about my own lived experiences, which like being a black indigenous woman in, in my experience can be very violent. And so some of the topics like in first grade would be like, oh yeah, maybe not add that when we do show and tell. Or like I would tell stories um, rurally on the reservation. Like I would, it was during like the Verizon flip phone, like I had a really nice flip phone and I had a camera on it. And it was just like, it was so great. So I'd like take videos of us like jumping off the bridge into the water, like us going to the store or like um, record fights. I was in like fight clubs. So I just like, we do different things and I would record them. And I knew like on my iPod touch and like my 
um, in my flip phone, like I like telling stories and I like recording them, even though at the time it was really weird. Cause like, why are you recording us just doing what we do? And now there's like res kids. And I'm like, I was doing res kids out here. We were like <laughs> doing that kind of stuff. And so like on the res, I was like recording stuff. Um, in the city, I was trying to like write stories and I would like get the kind of classes and exposure to like academia and like school in the city that was not available on the reservation. And so like going back and forth, I would like, I would like bring those two together and I would just like, you know, um, and so art for my mom um city and reservation experiences like figuring out oh I like to record oh I like to tell stories um I did a little bit of modeling um and then I feel like once I got to college I kind of just toned down and got more like in, in like um I came in undecided but I was in the native studies program as like my minor and so there were a lot of classes where we would learn about playwrights we would watch um, Native and Indigenous like um, movies. We'd watch Smoke Signals. We'd watch like the movies that we had and stuff. Um, and so I got to get into that and be like, okay, well, what does Native art look like at a collegiate level? What does it look like for me on the res in the city? What does it look like for me with my mom? Um, and so I just kind of started liking stuff. And then <laughs> my auntie Amber was like helping me out with stuff and be like, you want to be an ensemble member? And I was like, heck yes um and yeah so now I'm here in Sacramento California sorry I'm really trying to think about like I'm still like learning about my own story and how I've come to things because I really I'm starting to realize like oh well I like doing that and that makes sense for me liking this now or like yeah but I never really thought even though I was around art I never really thought that there was a place for me or I never really thought like oh most coming of age stories about young women are usually young white women and they can like talk back to their parents they can sneak out and go drink and I was like I can't do those things one like the native population is heavily like um hurt by a lot of the things it's just like I just didn't see myself in a lot of like media portrayals um I didn't see myself in these spaces even though I was around art but um we're here and I know I will get better at telling my story and the more <laughs> but yeah it, I think it was just like um getting opportunities and like help from getting mentoring from family um, and being, yeah, just like, yes. <laughs> yes. yes, well, just affirming your storytelling too, because like even the few projects that I've been with you on, like the way you write a script, bring a story together, I'm like, this is brilliant, Lafani. Because <laughs> um, then it's also transitioned to you being into like TikTok. Like you, that's what you're really doing right now too as a Gen Z activist, you're breaking down like the narrow state stereotypes, the native monolith. Do you want to talk about that too? Like what your work on TikTok? Yeah, most definitely. Um, so during the start of the pandemic, it was like, oh, TikTok's up. And I was like, TikTok? And so like I got on TikTok, I started making TikToks about like um, Chilliquin, Oregon, which is like the res area, my homelands. Um, and I started making TikToks like in my Black Indigenous lens, like what it means to be Native, what it means to be a woman, what it means to be Black, what it means to be Indigenous, Tongan. Um, and like some of our issues on the res that are happening, like um, what's happening with the climate tribes and how I experienced that through my own lens. And like, I feel like the main thing that people think about Native Americans is like, one, we, we don't exist. Two, we look like the lady on the Land of Lakes butter um three were just like just like all of these things and I just knew growing up like I was never like this and like I'm like I wanted to just show like what my lens looked like and like with TikTok you have seven seconds for like to catch someone's full attention you have three seconds to just grab it and seven seconds to keep them with you and so I was just like what could I share and it's really basic so I was just like oh what tribes am I from and I just be like boom 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 add some music add some text and like people would see it, but I didn't realize like it was something that would be helpful for people to visually see because visually we're usually in roles that don't protect us and don't um, help us with our narratives or our story or help us stand around in our own power. So I was like, you know what, if I can't get into, if I can't get signed to an agency, if I can't get into this movie, what if I just create my own space for that? Um, and so, yeah, I just make mostly TikToks about like tribal issues. I try to advocate for my tribes, for myself and my own experiences because there's so many Black Native, Black Indigenous, 
um, people out there who don't get representation and most people don't even know that we exist or that that's a valid thing just because of um, media's portrayal of natives in general is very violent. But yeah, digital creation on TikTok is dope. And like, I love music, you can add stuff. Um, and I found a pretty cool uh, creative community of like black indigenous, indigenous and native um, creators. And I'd like love to see what they post. Um, and yeah, it's really cool. And it's a big, I feel like TikTok's a big difference um, from like, cause like all virtual you get like, all different kinds of people we can like talk about things because over the screen you can't like no one's gonna shoot you if you talk about what you want to talk about like necessarily over the screen like i could talk about this and feel safe in myself but like in person out here like not just sacramento but just like in person it's just like it's harder to create and stand in your power because there is like those acts of violence that are very physical and in person so i found like a lot of creative freedom and like expression for myself virtually um, just because it feels safer, even though it's not the same. But. <laughs> yes, thank you for sharing. That actually kind of like leads us into the next part of the conversation. I think I'd love to hear more from each of you. It's just diving into your works, methodology, and practices. Each of you has amazing careers in storytelling, and you all have delved into theater and digital storytelling. So I was hoping you can share with us your methodology or approach telling and sharing story as well as the importance, maybe even specific projects. Um, Muriel, you finished TV Tales from Soup earlier this year and converted it to a short film with Safe Harbors NYC and the Reflections of Native Voices Festival. So this story follows your family as well as the history of Native American law and policy aligned with it. I was wondering, can you share with us the process of how you just start sharing a story? as well as the importance and relevance today of this story with the history shared and all these cycles that appear through our um, histories. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested really is I'm interested in flawed people. And I think if you are a normal person you have no place in my plays or on stage with me, I really don't. <laughs> I love people who are comically flawed, tragic, tragically flawed. Um, and I forgot to neglect earlier that one of the, the main part of my work is making a safe place called safe harbors, but making a safe place for you to correct that the mistake, if there is a mistake, isn't really a mistake, right? The mistake is, can be something brilliant if you turn it around, if you do it in a different way. Um, I learned from my family, the spider woman, um, uh, methodology and technique of story weaving, you know, and I really do that sometimes. And then sometimes I just, when I want to get stories out from other people, then I write it down and I figure out how that's going to be done. But sometimes I just write and I just write monologues first. And sometimes the monologue turns into a scene. And so then you take one thing of monologue, you put it somewhere and say, oh, this is for something different. And that's what happened with TV Tales is because I had all of these, because there were certain things that people said to me after Don't Feed the Indians, a divine comedy pageant. They, a lot of different people said, the next play you do is about your family in theater and your family in New York City. Because really what I was talking about was tropes. Um, and I was talking about when the laughter is no longer, uh, at, with you, it's at you, and for the expense of a white audience, right? So the whole idea of Don't Feed the Indians was, what does it mean to survive in all of this? What does it mean to, how do you make money? How do you live, you know? And there was a lot of showbiz times that all of us had to do certain, our families had to do things to live because we weren't allowed to practice our culture and practice our language and practice, you know, any of those things that was outlawed. And a lot of people don't know that, right? So they get into a room with us, a lot of people, and they wonder why we have this attitude. We're like, no, this is our land. You know, land, you know, we acknowledge where we are, who we are, what clans we are, uh, where we're from, and our family history. And part of that family history for me is I grew up in uh, Brooklyn in a really urban experience when it was an all Italian neighborhood. And for many, many years, people, you know, what happens in particularly in New York, 
is that other people come here and they say, oh, well, you know, there's no Indians in New York, so let's make up history. And I'm a believer like, hey, we're here. What do you mean? We weren't allowed to, we couldn't go to another. We as uh, I, how about this? How about me? Because I can't speak for anyone but myself. I can't go to another community and say, oh, you know, the, this is the original land of so-and-so. You need to honor them. I can't do that. You, you, you know, that's against our ways. So that's the idea of talking about our community and where we're coming from in our community. Right. And what are these stories? What are these different stories? TP Tales itself is about crossing barriers because my story can be your story, your story could be my story, but this is my particular story. Right. And nor does one Native story represent all Native people. And that's what people really don't understand. I'm just telling my story. I'm talking about being an Indian. Who, who, who calls herself an Indian with other Indians, you know, and doesn't like to be in the woods, right? <laughs> I mean, and, and I've heard people say, you need to get back down to earth. No, thank you. I'm done. I'm done with this. I, I live in Jersey now. I could barely take Jersey. I'm like, I need New York. Yeah, I can't. I can't do this anymore. But, you know, if I have to go out to the woods, I'll go on a vacation. You know, I don't know. You know, um, you know, like Boca or something, but I'm not, you know, if I have to go and, and do a religious practice, I go back to those ceremonies that I know I have to do, right? But if you become this anomaly, or if that's the correct word, on being an urban Indian, right? Because everyone's always assuming you don't know anything, you know? I mean, same thing, when you were telling the story is about when I was in New York, just working as an actress, I, you know, I was told all kinds of things. I was told you didn't look Indian enough. You, you shouldn't like, you ever think about, oh, I have so many stories. Like, let's, you know, you, you should look like a grunt. This grunge was in, I think I'm dating myself. And I did my hair dark and I did this curly thing. And they were like, you know, you have to look goth. And I made my face like light, light, light. And I went through this. And my husband looked at me. He said, are you sick? I said, this is the new look. <laughs> and it was like, for a who? <laughs> You know, I mean, there was like all these different looks that, you know, you have to grease up your hair and you black it, you know, it was like, because you're never going to be called, you know, in for a native part. And again, I couldn't perm my hair. I couldn't keep my hair short like this, you know, because native people don't have curly hair in their eyes. They don't have short hair. Right. And so, and so that, that trope continues, right. And also can it continues in, bo in body issues and where we are even going as a country and how we see Native people. You know, uh, you know, a lot of women are extremely sexualized and you can go all the way back to boarding schools, right? The boarding school is the core, is the core. All of us who have been there are two generations, one generation boarding school. And some of us are not even that far. So that's what my play TP Tales is about. Why that fear? Why that neurosis fear? You know, how we only stuck together and how it was embedded in us, you know, to stay with your community. Don't let people in your house, you know, which I rang true the other day. I've let someone in my house and they find me for having an ashtray. <laughs> so going back that you don't let people back in your house. Um, but why is that? Why is that? It doesn't just come from the air, this mistrusting that we have for government, this mistrusting that we have for institutions. We are true mistrust um, because these institutions have really done things to us, you know? And we're seeing that again, you know, we kind of see that with the vaccine too. A lot of people are so scared of the vaccine um, because of those, those, those reasons, right? And COVID, what it did was it made us, we had to stay home, we had to sit with ourselves, and we had to think about what is at the core? What is the core of generations, right? And the thing for me was it was boarding schools. And people have been talking about this. We, you know, it just got discovered for some reason, you know, I, 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 that makes me crazy, you know. Okay, it's been it's discovered. No, every day all of us are living with the reality that we come from a place that some of us don't speak our language because of boarding schools. So you had a whole house 
everyone spoke their language and then you have a mother who didn't so you only could only understand and then you you know little by little and how that was you know and you you see this you see this in many communities you know many different communities so that is really my work is but how do you do it in a comic light right and i always think of comedy like um you know you have to serve a spaghetti enchilada right not spaghetti enchilada spinach enchilada and you want to put some like a lot of cheese in it to make it unhealthy but there's still spinach so that's how I got it. so you get you to nutrition you know but you put some stuff in there to make it you know tasty and that's how i feel about comedy let's make it funny it's not all funny but you know i'm a little i i would like to practice joy as we say all the time of our culture Yes, a lot was taken away, but the joy that we still are here, right? We have these great voices. We're being seen on television now. We're doing, you know, we're really, and it, you know, to me, that is, and I think we even have further to go, really, 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 you know, instead of, you know, how do we not typecast, you know, but that's a, you know, how do we not typecast if we want to do, you know, Cat on the Hot Tin Roof, for example? No, it's never written Maggie is white. Never. So it's never written that it's a native, that it's a, a, a non person of color family. Ibsen, maybe, you know, but it's never written that way, you know. So I think those things are very interesting. And then from there, you bring your own stories, you know. Why can't Auntie Mame be a uh, boarding school survivor and saves her nephew? I don't know, but something like that, you know, that's what, I, that's kind of my work is taking things and putting it, making it funny, but then really hard punching at the end. Yes, and just as for Joy too, TP Tales just was a ball of and you comedy directed and it. joy. Yeah, well, just you have working to. with you is the most wonderful thing. <laughs> I was like, you and are you directed in Amber. <laughs> She never always keeps that out. Her just being, they told me what to do. Morgan was our dramaturg. My dramaturg said to her, whatever you do, Amber, don't trust Muriel because she will cut all her monologues down to five sentences. Because She'll say she doesn't like saying it. And she just takes, she takes with that pen. Do not let her cut everything. Like, Muriel, get back to work. No. <laughs> not catching me you know and it just we would call because it was during this pandemic we made this film and my daughter was the director here it was and and then she would call up amber and she'd say did you say that amber i said amber told me to do it this way amber was like i never said that <laughs> okay oh, but it's a joy. yeah <laughs> that's why i just yeah love about each of you too is just centering joy even in this conversation the joy that i've been brought in so thank you for bringing that up <laughs> um jeanette i wanted to turn it over to you um you have such an extensive career interweaving your theatrical experience within film and tv you shepherded more than 20 new plays to world premiere productions a part of the groundbreaking ultra lab playwright residency program I was hoping you would talk to us about your process of selection, stewarding work, methodology for the program. It's kind of a large question, but it's just something that's so important and how you've just supported all these playwrights. I love talking about Ultra Lab. I am happy to talk about that. Um, it's one of the things that I'm most excited about. And it's also a lot easier for me not to be talking about myself. Lafani Tani, I so um, identified with what you said about I'm still learning to tell my story. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I've been grappling with, I'm sorry, tangent, um, but one of the things that I've been grappling with is realizing that I have learned to make myself and my story palatable for, for um, people who come from a certain privileged background. And, you know, there are lots of things about myself that I don't share because the majority of the people around me don't get it and can't get it. And rather than it being something that... Um, leads to anything positive or, you know, greater understanding or, or anything, it just, it, it puts up a barrier and a wall. And yet, 
it's just, it's a struggle too, because then you, you find your identity bifurcating and you're yourself with your family and with your community and you're somebody else in your professional spaces. And so for me, I think at this point in my career, I'm at a point where I don't, I don't really care anymore. So like being myself and fully myself and all this, the spaces that I inhabit is something that I'm looking forward to for this, this next part of my personal journey. So I just, I love you for naming that and being able to name that because it's taken me like 20 years just to be able to even say that. Um, so, so back to Alter Lab. Um, uh, <laughs> I would say that um, Alter Lab got started in part because um, at Alter Theater, the, the company has always really been about the creative growth of theater artists and supporting that and how do we do that and how do we make change in our community um, by supporting artists. Um, and what we, we started a commissioning program first and we discovered that we weren't really supporting playwrights. We were supporting a play. We were supporting a product. And we wanted to be more about the process. And so Todd London published this book and did a bunch of research um, called uh, Outrageous Fortune, The Life and Times of the New American Play. And he had conversations all over the country, including a really great one in Berkeley, California at the Aurora Theater that I was at and Octavio Solis was at and a whole bunch of Bay Area new play um, practitioners and, and playwrights and creators and producers were at. Um, and so like, the, the conversation ended officially. They kicked us out of the theater and a whole group of us was like outside the door, still like talking and talking and talking and talking. And one by one, people were peeling off. And then finally there were five of us left. Um, and then like, I, I forget who said it, but one of us said, you know what, let's just, let's go out for lunch and let's continue the conversation. And so three more people peeled away and it was just me and Octavio. And we essentially um, hammered out like, what, what, do, what, does, what do Bay Area playwrights need to truly be supported as artists? Um, and so then I went out and I talked one-on-one -on -one with other Bay Area playwrights asking, what do you need? What barriers are you hitting? Um, what can help propel you to the next stage of your career and of your art making? Um, and so from those conversations, I created, um, and, and you know, usually at Alter Theater, it's really the ensemble is creating things, but this is something that I came up with and I rammed it down their throats and I just, I, we're doing this. Um, and luckily, everybody else was thoroughly on board. But man, that that first meeting when I proposed this, I, my heart was like beating so hard. Um, but that there are three things. It's meant to be a playwright centered and playwright empowered residency. And there are only three things that Alter Theater asks of its of each playwright cohort. One is that they self identify a creative risk or artistic challenge that they want to take with their work. And it can be about product, it can be about process, it can be anything. Uh, we had one playwright who came in and said, it takes me three years to write a play. The fact that you require us to write a play in one year, that's my challenge. I have to make a serious change in my process to be able to accomplish this. Um, the second part is that you have to support your fellow writers in, um, in the residency, and that includes holding them accountable to the challenges that they name. And then you have to write a new play over the course of the year. Everything else is up to the playwright. And um, it's been really exciting. I, I'm always shocked uh, by how different each playwright cohort is. Uh, some of them meet monthly, some of them bring in pages, some of them like meet quarterly for like really intensive weekends. Some of them are like, bring me dramaturgs. Some of them are, keep the dramaturgs out. Um, and this most recent cohort, which is, which is the first time we're doing it on Zoom, like one of the things, we have a very active ensemble company and they all love new work. And we have actors who are like, yes, let me come in and read some new pages. Um, and so like, we'll have like 10, 15 new pages from a playwright and we'll have actors come in and read them so that the, the playwrights can hear them out loud. And these playwrights are like, no, I'm not ready for actors. We'll just read them amongst ourselves. Just the playwrights can read it. Um, and I even have one playwright who's like, it just makes me anxious to hear the word, to, to hear the work out loud. Can you guys just read it ahead of time and then we can discuss the, the, the play? And I'm like, 
cool. You know, I think that so many new work programs are really geared around the institution and what uh, what has somebody at the institution decided is a good way to develop and create new work. And they forget to check in with the artists. Um, one of the things that our playwrights in our most recent Alter Lab, this current cohort is meeting once a month on Zoom for three hours. So we just had uh, our monthly meeting a couple of days ago. And like three of our writers were like, man, I just cannot write at home. I wish I had a place to go to. And this is the first cohort where I've had people say that. And I don't know if that's a function of the pandemic or you know, if it's these particular writers. But you know, I always ask, I always invite everybody to ask for what support they need. We're a teeny tiny theater company, brutally under-resourced, but sometimes I have access to really unexpected things. And if I don't have access, maybe I can create a partnership to get you access to that resource. So I always say, ask for whatever it is that you need. Um, and, um, and, and so that's, that's really the heart of the, of the program. Um, it's been incredibly diverse. Um, more than two thirds of the writers are BIPOC. 85% of writers have been women. Um, and I think what's also really great is that the program proves that being invested in the artist and the process ultimately works. It, it results in really great work because our plays and our playwrights are going on to other theaters. One of the first plays we produced, the one of the first plays we developed and then produced was picked up by Oregon Shakespeare Festival for their season. Um, Larissa Fast Horse was twice commissioned with us before she went to Playwrights Horizons and became the first native, hopefully not the last, just the first native playwright produced off Broadway. Um, so we have these success stories and more and more theaters are starting to look at our writers and wanting to build partnerships and asking for plays as opposed to me calling them up and saying, hey, remember me? We met at that TCG conference and I know that your theater is interested in this and boy, do I have a BIPOC writer for you to read. Um, you know, and, and so it's, it's about that commitment to the artist, not just to, to the product. And, and the commitment to the artist includes helping them get to wherever they next want to go. Um, and, you know, using whatever resources and relationships I have and can develop to help them with that. And, and, and also it's a multi-year thing too, because we're, you know, if I don't have relationships that can help them with their goal, they start with us before they write a single word. So I have like a good year and a half to go develop those relationships and create those resources, knock on wood. Um, and then the final thing that I'll just say about Alter Lab that I think is so special is that we produce 100% of our commissions and on average about 75% of the work that we develop. I dare any large regional theater company to match us. It is not about let's get a commission and give it to the BIPOC writer so we can show how, oh my God. The, oh, I was about to like tell tales about somebody forgetting that it wasn't just the four of us. But anyway, you know, the, 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 yeah, yeah. If you are not producing the work that you are developing, are you really supporting that writer? Agreed. I'm like, mic drop. <laughs> I know. Well, also just aff affirming like the care that you provide for each playwright is so important and just stewarding that relationships. And I think that's such an important part of your methodology too, is just how you care for the relationships with the artists, your companies. And that's something that's truly valuable and important, especially in Native community. So just celebrating that aspect of it too. Um, and Lafani Tani, I forgot to mention and shout out your TikTok when you're talking about it, but Lafani's bio is listed in this whole series. So follow Lafani's TikTok. She has like thousands of followers. Forgot to mention that for your follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I wanted to get to your methodology and process too. You have this award-winning short film, The Bullock Honksha. It features an all Black Indigenous cast and ties into the settler colonial violence the Klamath Basin tribes are currently fighting with the water wars. 
So earlier you're kind of explaining some of that, just like how you approach story, but I was wondering if you would talk more about this film, how you did it, your methodology, editing. It's just a beautiful short. Um, if we can, we'll like post it on our sites too, because I, everyone needs to see it. That would be dope. Yeah. So um, earlier this year, I think March, it was right before my birthday. Uh, March, I um, I was in a like native media, like competition kind of like celebratory, like we're all making art. And so I decided I was like, I want to make a short film. I was already like developing and Amber, you're helping me like um, come up with like a script. And I was like, this is my perfect perfect opportunity to like make a short film. I want to add my siblings. And so um, Luella Concha was like that work. And so Luella Concha, um, three words, I believe it's it's um, in Mukluk Shoals, which is the language of the people, which is Klamath language. And Luella Concha means let's kill it. And I was like, yeah, I want to name it Luella Concha. Cause I, I work with our linguists sometimes. Cause I'm like, you know what? I want to learn how to say snag. Or I want to learn how to say this and that to make like the language more accessible. Cause I'm like, Gen Z, we have like all these, like, I just feel like there's so many ways that we can use our language that's like accessible and like use it. And I was like, how about what would be something that I would want to say on the regular? Let's kill it. So Luella Concha is the name of the piece, um, the piece, um, but let's see talk about it a little. Luella Concha is a short film. I would say it's like a Res Kids meets Goonies extravaganza. It's set on my ancestral homelands in Chilliwack, Oregon. And I would say it's like we talked about a little bit in this. Um, it's about like joy. Um, and it's about me and my two other siblings. I'm the oldest. I have two little tuppy ups, two little siblings. Um, and it's about uh, Black, indigenous, Black Indigenous joy, it's about body sovereignty, it's about land back, it's about um, having fun. And like, I think a lot of my process, because I've always felt like between the city and between the res, between my identities of being Black, Indigenous, Native, and like all these things, it's always felt like, oh, it's like life's a test. Like, I can't be wrong. Like, I have to be this, I have to be this to be Native. It's always like, I don't want to be wrong and so I would get so stressed about that and I just realized like let me just find the joy in this like I'm hella wrong all the time I like when I don't want to say the wrong things everything wrong and more comes out <laughs> and so I was like you know what I think my methodology is to just like do it and have fun and if I'm wrong like be wrong in a great way um and so I wanted to also like a part of like what I want to do as like an older sister as like the oldest child I want to like show my siblings like what we can do and I feel like living on my ancestral homelands in southern Oregon there's so much settler occupancy still there's so much agriculture that like rips and rapes the land and like we're still being logged and all of these things are just happening to us like um, settler induced climate change is happening and our summers are just all smoke and it's just like it's so much and I feel like from a young age being like indigenous black indigenous indigenous it's just like you're just thrust upon it it's not like oh maybe the teacher will teach us like these things and you experience the violence right away and so like I experienced that growing up being like wait, so I was like, first grade, I was like, wait, so why are we fighting for our salmon? Wait, people are trying to kill us. Wait, it doesn't make sense. Like, make it make sense. Um, and so I struggled with that, like understanding that concept of like, okay, well, people are always trying to kill us. We're always under attack. It's like, uh, under attack. It's always like fugitivity, it feels like. Um, and so I was like, you know what? My siblings are probably going through the same struggle right now and trying to metabolize and trying to exist in this space where it's constantly just like, nerves and anxiety and like violence and you're just trying to be a kid and so I was like you know what I think a film about us doing like a res dog this was like before res dogs had come out so like I was like you know what I love goonies I was like we need land back like this is a time where our fish our chuan which is our like one of our ancestor fish is like in trouble and is in danger within like seven years could like die and like for our people we know once the fish die like we're there's like we're, we're done um, and so I was like, this is the time for us to like take everything back, to be hella radical, hella rude, to not be politically correct necessarily, and to just like, let's kill it. So I was like, it goes through me and my siblings. It's all in our Mukluk Shaw's language. It's all in our language. Um, I have like English subtitles. Um, and we're just like, we see these cows and the cows are a representation of like settler colonialism and violence against our bodies. And you visually like, you'll see, you see them on our land. 
and next to our water and stuff. Um, and you're like, and we're just like, you know what? Let's kill it. Sorry, someone's like outside knocking. But we're just like, let's kill it. You know what? Because like, it's just a conversation in our community. Like we go to school with all these agriculture kids and we're like constantly being taught by these teachers that we're not worth anything. Um, and so I was like, what if we could just be like, no, you shut up. No, like I'm going to like, I cows are, cows can be cute. They could also be very nasty. But what would happen if we just, what if I just like, what if I just slapped it with like a fly swatter and it exploded? And then I could like eat the, the stuff that came off of it. And once the cows are gone, our water is, it doesn't have feces in it. And then our fish could live and then we're free. And I was like, what could that look like? Um, what can I like manifest with my siblings in this short film to make them think like, what if we were free? Like, what would we do? Would we like, would I kick stuff? Like, would I like punch things? Or like, would I go swimming? Or like, could we swim in our water again? So like, what would Black Indigenous joy and freedom look like? What would it look like if we could breathe easy on our homelands? What would it look like if we could just go run and like fall on something? Not that we don't do these things already, but what would it look like to take that power back? Um, and to show our community, which I feel like, not to say my community is scared or anything, but it's a scary environment. Like what would, it, what would it look like if we were visually empowered? Because most of, if you look up like Klamath, just like anything like Klamath Basin, Klamath area, it's always just like, I feel like the narratives are so sad. It's just like, so like, so sad. And I feel like a lot of Oh no, I think the screen froze. Um, we will hold for Wi-Fi connection. I don't know, it was just good story. Oh, you're Maybe. back, okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry, my Wi-Fi is so trash. I'm so sorry. No, it was great, trash. we're on the edge of our seats, we're like, come back. <laughs> like, where are we? I'm really mean. Where did where did it like where did I pause that? Um, you're describing the Klamath Basin tribes, the perception of like sadness, like when it's just like this brilliance of reclamation for land back. Yeah, it's always like all the movies that I'll see or all the content on my tri tribe is always like, yeah, and then they were hung, and then they died, or like, and and then history ended here, and you know what? Natives are just so sad, and they're just so. They're just on the little reses, you know, kicking cans and eating Kamad cheese. I don't like Kamad cheese necessarily, but like, just like all these things and all these like trauma point stereotypes. And even in college, like I had to like not beg for money, but I'd be like, yeah, this is my story. And it always had to be like a, like, I need money, I need corn, help me. Like, I'm like, okay, like, like, sure, yeah. But like, I'm also very bright and diligent. I think diligence, I don't know. But um, I was just like, oh, this trauma point is so frustrating. And I was like, I'm not little. I'm almost six feet tall. I like have a deep voice. Um, your girl, like chin hair, we out here just like, I'm not this like little thing. And I'm not, I'm not gentle sometimes. I can be, but I was just like, you know what? It's time. We need to save our fish. I need to like show our, my, I want to show my siblings. I want to show our community that we're not little. We're big. We have power in a place that people make us feel powerless. And like, if we want to explode, explode a cow, it might be absurd, but like, let's do it. And like, what would that look like? I'm going to smear all this stuff on my face and I'm going to like throw money in the air. Um, and so I want it, I want the short film to expand into like a series of like just, cause even, even making that short film on our homelands, like people would walk by us who are like not our people and they would just try to make us feel uncomfortable. Like we weren't supposed to be there. I was like, sir, get your dog before I kick it to space. Um, like, <laughs> and so just like, it was just so nice to be like, here's a camera. Not that we need a reason to be there, but I was like, we're making a movie. I am directing that. I was like, nope, we're still making it. Um, so it was just cool to reclaim that space visually that way because it's always not us in charge of our narratives and it's always us not in charge of our bodies and what happens to it. Um, and to also like leave something for just like my siblings know that we can do that. They know that we can expl explode cows like we did it um, and we can get free and that, that can look a bunch of different ways and like you can have power through art um, and it doesn't have to look like a certain thing it doesn't have to be like I'm painting fruit like you can paint fruit 
but like there's also different ways and it can be accessible um because I was out there and we were like throwing we had a bunch of like stuff in the yard like my process for finding props which at the time I didn't know okay I didn't know like a lot of like theater words or like words and so I was like you know what we had this suitcase from somewhere in the yard and I opened it I was like okay go grab me that toilet paper from the house grab that weight that's just randomly in the yard it's like 50 pounds grab that plushy toy from your thing okay grab that stick the pine cone and then I want that boot just that one boot because it's just outside in the rain in the pool thing and so I was just like those are the props and like using the things around you I think really helped me um to be true to myself um and yeah it was yeah that was kind of like my process and um and I used iMovie to edit it which was really accessible for me and um I just posted on my YouTube channel and I'm working on a website we're gonna make it um but yeah I really I didn't know that I liked doing that kind of stuff until I made that and I kept watching it and my siblings liked it and then I posted on TikTok and then other people from the community saw it and like um I just thought it's cool because it's not we're not being like hush hush like save our mom like save us like no more dams like please it's no longer please it's like give it let's kill it and give me give me my land back like I'm not gonna buy it back even though I might have to start with buying land back but like it's not a question it's an answer so <laughs> that was kind of my process a little bit yes thank you for sharing it and just celebrating your creativity with it too like found objects props the incorporation of your family I think that's so important and brilliant too, because I don't know if no, but you're already setting up the next generation of storytellers. That's, that's something that's really powerful too. So yeah, celebrating your short film, Fani. Thank you for sharing it with us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. Let's see. So I figured we could go ahead and wrap up the conversation. Um, what I would love to hear from all of you, um, whether you have like upcoming projects, productions, what you have in the works for us to look forward to, just anything that you want to share um, kind of as our closing closing question. Let's see, Jeanette, we'll start with you. Now this I could go on forever and ever about, so I'm not sure you want to start with me. <laughs> you want to be able to cut me off. Um, I, I love um, the, the discussion of Native Joy because that brings me to Snag, um, which is the, uh, a, film, a, a play by Tara Moses, and we are doing a filmed version of it. And it is, we think, the world's first Native American romantic comedy. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's, we were, we were going to try to, to release that for in time for Valentine's Day, but because of COVID, the, the schedule's moving back a little bit, but it's just, it's, it's so much fun. There is no trauma. I mean, there's a little bit of a dark edge to it um, because, you know, we're natives, we have to, but it is funny. And it is just so, to be able to see beautiful native people just falling in love and like trying to make it work. Um, it's just, it's powerful and it's healing. And I think it's just what we need right now. So that's what I'm working on. Um, and then finally, oh my gosh. So right uh, about, a, a, so, so we talked a little bit about our journeys and I've spent like 20 years now helping other people tell their stories. And for the first time in my professional career, I was about to produce a story that actually represented my family and the conversations that we have around our dinner table. And, um, like a month and a half before we, we were set to go into rehearsals for that, COVID just closed theaters down. And so of all the shows to have to postpone, my heart just broke into 10,000 pieces that that was the show. Um, and, you know, we, we put it back in the season. We're going to do it outdoors. It's going to be our first show back with live audiences. And um, it's scheduled for summer 2022. Pure Native by Vicki Ramirez. Um, and then the third thing that I'll talk about is the Arts Learning Project for Native Youth, which I think may be the most exciting thing that I've ever done. Um, we were originally scheduled to take Pure Native. We were going to produce it in the Bay Area and then take it um, on tour to different Native reservations. And, um, you know, the reses, of course, um, shut down, COVID, hello. 
um, tour was canceled even before the production itself was finally, you know, um, postponed indefinitely. Um, but um, at one point, one of our tribal liaisons called us up and said, hey, the res is shut down. All the summer programs are, are non-existent. Parents are struggling. They need something to do with their kids. As part of Pure Native, we were going to do some um, uh, workshops, um, intergenerational workshops with the community. Um, so the, our, our tribal liaison said, you know, those, those workshops, could you do something virtually with our kids? And we're like, yes, let me get back to you on that. And a month later, we put together, we, we ran a week-long um, monologue writing workshop and introduction to 3D storytelling um, with uh, Native kids from three different reservation communities. Um, or actually, no, we had five different reservation communities that first time. And it was just so rewarding. The kids had a great time. Parents loved it. Um, they asked us for more. And so we have this whole program now and it culminated, not culminated, but it grew to um, an, our first in-person program, which was a five-day sleepaway acting camp on a college campus with students coming in from different uh, communities. Um, and it was just, it was, it was so rewarding. And um, it's just so great to be working with our kids. And in fact, Lafon and Tani, I, there's one, one of our students, I, I so want to talk to you because some of our students are working on Thacker Pass, Protect Thacker Pass, um, and trying to get uranium, or not uranium, um, lithium mining not to happen on their res. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we, we got to talk. Um, and yeah, so anyway, just the, just Native Joy, working with Native kids and, and creating an environment where Native kids are always aware that they belong, that their stories matter, that their voices matter, and that there is a place for them in this industry. Because growing up, I didn't have that. Um, you know, do you, I studied theater in college. I went looking for Native plays and Native playwrights. I didn't hear about Spider Woman Theater Collective until after I graduated from college, the only native play I read was by a white guy. And I was just like, this isn't my experience of being native, what the heck? I finally found a Bill Yellow Road play like two years after I graduated. And that's just wrong. That is so wrong. Native kids shouldn't have to, to feel so invisible in this field. Um, and, and come on, we're the original storytellers of this land. And funders have got to get behind that too, because hello, we just got turned down for a grant because they're like, native theater isn't traditional. Like, excuse me, hello, no, no, no. So yeah, so lots of native joy in my upcoming projects and um, hopefully they will all get fully funded and yay. Sorry, it took yes. No, I'm like, Yes, celebrating Native Joy celebrations. And thank you so much for your work of like stewarding the generations. Like that's beautiful thinking seven generations ahead. So yes, thank you, Jeanette, for your closing thoughts. Um, Muriel, we'll take it off to you now. Love to hear you about projects, productions, what you have in the works. Any like joy and celebrations too, because I'm like, yeah. Okay, so what I'm working on, I'm working on four major projects at this point. It's TP Tales from the Stoop. Um, where we're going to be doing at the New York Theater Workshop for our Reflections of Native Voices Festival that New York, um, that we produce, uh, that Safe Harbors produces. It's one of the only Native um, theater festivals that's on um, Off-Broadway and Off-Off-Broadway. We involve La Mama Theater and New York Theater Workshop. In the beginning, we had four theaters and now we're trying to break it down into how do we do because of COVID we learned a big lesson was that one person shows work really well and how do we produce our own work that we're interested in and along with that is the um, artistic um, not the, the director's labs that we are trying to establish we were able to establish it last year uh, this year when we were in um, California and we were able to talk about process and what does that mean and the retreats and how we're able to breathe and how does that coincide with my second project, which is Feast of Ghosts. Feast of Ghosts is an outdoor play. Um, we just received the NIFA uh, for it. 
and it's a <laughs> it's a it's a it's a it's a, a Fellini as I keep on calling it a Fellini esque ghost story, not a spirit story, but it's a ghost story. And how do we tell our stories about death and keep it and and talk about boarding schools? But then how do we you know talk about joy? There has to be like there was always clowns in our society, so we're thinking you know how do we do that? And you know and it was the lot one of TP Tales was one of my collaborative efforts with my husband, and this is the last collaborative effort with my husband. And so it's four stories, four directions, four directors, one master director who pulls it all together. And we have the opportunity to bring in other younger, or not even younger, emerging directors who want to go from acting, playwriting, and to really talk about directing and how it works for them. Because what happens, if you look at the statistics with Native directors in the United States, we're not even in that statistic. And so what happens a lot with a lot of these uh, Native playwrights is what I found during Reflections of Native Voices, that the language, you don't have to teach Native 101 when you are working with a Native director. I don't, you know, you don't have to say so, you know, a lot of times there's an understanding and that starts with the cultural exhaustion that we get all of the time because it turns into cultural extraction too, because a white director is getting a lot out of a native person because they've never deal, dealt with this. So you're explaining land, you're explaining water, you're explaining colorisms, you're explaining tribal politics, you're explaining, you know, and you have to say sometimes to these directors, look, me and you get along, okay? This ain't we or the world when you get into the room with 50 Indians. You gotta watch what you say. And they never listen to me. And I'm, I just sit there and I go, what? I, I don't, I, I can't help you. <laughs> I, can't, I can't help you, you know? So I felt that, and I'm not saying that, I believe that the cultural exhaustion is a big part of what we go through as native peoples. But also the other end here is, I want also Native peoples to be able to direct other, you know, why do we only directing Native things? Non-Natives are always directing our stuff. Always, 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 always. And they don't get pushed back. Well, now they do. But in the beginning, they didn't. There was no pushback. And so if a Native person directs a non-Native play, let's say, Will we get pushed back? That's where I think we're at right now. And how do we start that conversation? Because if theater is about going further and the creativity and fairness, we are not ever part of that fairness. Especially when non-Indians were playing, you know, Indian roles. And we know this. It's not like I'm making this up and I'm being some radical here. We know this. And we put up with it, right? Because at least there was something. But now we have to get, I believe, we have to get out of that more than it's just something. And the younger generation where I feel a lot of times and I feel like, like you, Jeanette, is that when they start, you know, I, I'll take a lot, right? Because I want the project to go further. I want, you know, and these are all people I train. We're all in the room and I'll, bend over backwards, I'll be diplomatic, and they'll turn around and say, oh, no, you're rude. And you're like, oh, good. Oh, okay, we're going to fight. All right. <laughs> I wouldn't say fight this fast, but okay. <laughs> but it happens because the younger generation, Amber's generation, and my daughter's generation, what they're not do, what they're doing is they're not taking it. And they're saying, you're not going to abuse another Indian while you're on my watch and someone we respect. Or, and I see it vice versa. So, and, and they're out fighting, you know, you know, because we're dealing with, I believe too, is we're dealing with not a um, glass ceiling. We are dealing with a buckskin ceiling that you can't even see through. It's tied or whatever. And you got to take a knife and rip it down and pull it open and then go through and say, we're here. I mean, there's no other way to do this, right? And then it's always, oh, you're so angry. Yes, I'm angry. Yes, I'm angry. There's only 2% of directors in the United States doing Native work. Why is that? 
well, they don't fill out the paperwork. Come on, give me a break. There's not enough for you. Come on, give me a break. How come our statistics are so high for alcoholism and diabetes? How come that? But our statistics are, uh, but we're so low uh, uh, with our statistics in general. Come on, you know? And so that's really why I get myself worked up. But that's where I am, you know, with these, you know, with the projects. So I think they're all interlaced. And then the last project I have that me and Amber are working on is um, called the center. And center, the center is set in the 80s. It's a, it's a bit of a coming out story, but it's loosely based on Hamlet. And it's about an Indian center and all the dynamics that happens in the Indian center. So there's a ghost in the Indian center from the old executive director and the, <laughs> and the people who know all the business, all who tell all the stories like the guards, if we have ever lit, worked at an Indian center, we know that the, the a receptionist knows everything and the janitor. So <laughs> every day tell the story, they're like, well, you'll never, and then it comes in and how does it become that come of age story? It, it doesn't hit boarding schools as much, but it's about, one is an outdoor theater piece, which is Feast of Ghosts. And this one is, that's the last project I, that I'm doing. Um, so I think that is it. And, and Feast of Ghosts, we plan on doing a 20, 20 well, our, we, we'll be working on it till 2024, right? Is that what we're thinking? 2024 will be, the, will be our real tour, right? I think COVID and everything, but and all these are going to development because I want to get as many stories from many different people it is. And believe me, Feasts of Ghosts, I got the idea from Gangs of New York. See, that's what I'm saying. You can get that idea anyway. And it's the last parting scene of the World Trade Center. And when they they kill uh, the butch, the, uh, what's his name? The Bolton. Well, what's his name? Bill the Butcher and Leonardo, they leave these graves and they leave and you see New York changing and you see the graves get smaller and smaller and smaller. And then you see the World Trade Center. And what I always took it is we are always on land that have these stories of, uh, of buried people of the dead. And what happens when those stories aren't told? And during COVID, we found that it brought us all the way back to our, you know, our genocide. So we have to really talk about, I believe. And so that is, that is what, that's what I'm working on. I hope I didn't go so long. <laughs> Not at all. Just celebrating all the works um, and celebrating the care that you're putting into these stories and histories um, and caring for like each individual person that you're bringing into these productions too. So Thank you so much for sharing too, Muriel. Um, and we look forward to seeing it with Safe Harbors. <laughs> Yay. Um, and Lofani Tani, we would love to hear you too about any upcoming projects, productions, what you have in the works for us to look forward to. Yeah, so I feel like in the past two weeks, I kind of just entered the theater the theater industry, yes. So that was really cool. And I just like found a lot of freedom in that because I just feel like I've often had to like people please and like not like just be very palatable and kind of just like learning who I am. And so I really enjoyed like that reading, the opening of the New American Theater Festival, being in exhaustion, that was so cool. Um, and so now I've gotten another opportunity to stay a little bit longer in Sacramento. Um, it'll be in the play, uh, Smart People. And so I'll be, it'll be in November. So I have like a part in there. I'm really excited, um, but I don't want to say too much. Yeah, but I'll be in that. And so I'm like really excited. I need to learn my lines. I have so much, like there's so much terminology I don't know. So I need to do that. I need to like watch a lot of stuff. Um, but I think in the upcoming, I'm not sure specifically what like my plans are for like the upcoming year or five years or anything. I did have plans before the pandemic pandemic Lovato pandemic I forget because on TikTok everybody calls it something different um but the panoramic the pandemic um but now my plans my plans have completely changed but I think overall in the next few years hopefully just this year um I'll be able to learn get more experience in the theater world um acting directing just like all of it because I can smell art out here and like it's super cool and just like seeing all these creatives just like standing in their power being powerful and saying no um saying yes and like to hear from y'all it's just so inspiring and I just like I want to like keep doing stuff and keep learning um 
and like see what m myself and these how I can exist in these spaces and how I want to and what that can look like and like push it even further because I know like there's we can create even more space and like I'm really interested to see like um I've changed a lot in the last two weeks and I want to like what 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 will happen in a month so I just I really want to just like learn a lot experience a lot be like on sets or like read lines for people or just like anything I think a lot of experience is needed for me right now and a lot of growth um and to help other people with their creative like goals would be awesome just to like yeah so I just like basically I want to live <laughs> I'd love to be alive um yeah but I just I'm not sure what the future uh, plans are but um I'm going one day at a time and like as long as it's art as long as I'm with dope people which like I'm in it right now I think I manifested this like a month ago um but yeah just to keep in the art keep with dope people and like keep building myself um and keep like figuring out what my narrative is and like how all of it is um and I'm so blessed to be in this space with y'all today because I'm I learned so much today and like it's just dope to see this happening um yeah that's yeah great things are coming <laughs> Mm -hmm. awesome and just celebrating you Lafani too um, like everything that you've accomplished like I don't know if you got to it but you also just got that writer's residency with Illuminatives for that like up and coming writers program too um was that for your film you said what wait Illuminatives wait, what? they put you on their page <laughs> they had your selfie on there and they're like congratulations oh. to the writers program Oh my gosh. This was like oh, last God. week. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're probably no, just out there doing yeah. great things. <laughs> I knew that. You're, yes. Anti work, yes. anti work. I know. I this is like, what okay. it do. <laughs> yeah. me. Just okay. celebrating your work, Lafani. And we look forward to like watching your continued, even storytelling on TikTok. It's just so important, like what you're adding to that sphere. You're resonating with so many people on many different platforms. So congratulations for that work too. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, and thank you all again. Thank you all so much for joining this conversation. It was truly an honor and a privilege to learn from you all today. And thank you for the audience for joining us as well. You can find more information about these amazing individuals, their companies they represent, and more in the panel descriptions on HowlRound. In the Margins, New American Theater Festival continues through October 23rd. Oh, wait, Jeanette, you have one more thing to mention. Really quick, um, Alter Theater is announcing on Indigenous Peoples Day the opening of a new commission. Um, it's a partnership with La Lengua, La Lengua Teatro en Español, and it is for decolonization stories. So it'll be released all over social media and whatnot. So hopefully y'all will see it, but uh, yeah. That's amazing. And, and, it's, and it's specifically about supporting language revitalization. Mm. Um, we're working on a commission with Blossom Johnson, and one of the things that came up was, you know, are we truly fluent in our languages, even those uh, who are lucky enough to speak their languages, if we can't convey humor in our language? And I'm like, hmm, how can theater and storytelling support native um, language revitalization and efforts in that way? So I'm super excited about this. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing. Wait, yes, on that note, everyone, Happy Indigenous Peoples Day! Celebrating yeah. you everywhere. Let's go. Indigenous <laughs> Peoples so Day is every day. Is every day. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so all much. Right. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye,